Good morning and welcome to the broadcast today and thank you for tuning in and joining us. Uh, it is delightful to have you sharing the Word of God with us today. It's a beautiful day outside and I trust that it's just as beautiful inside wherever you are and we praise God for the opportunity uh, to share His Word on this beautiful Wednesday morning. Our broadcast today goes out in memory of all of those uh, who have died in Haiti. Over 2,000 people dead after a massive earthquake. And so I want to pause this morning uh, to remember those in prayer. Sometimes I think uh, children of God uh, in some places forget that it's by God's grace that we are not consumed or destroyed. And so... Uh, while that massive earthquake was there, it could have been where we are, and of course it could have taken our lives, and God has spared us. So I want us to do that. Uh, let me uh, just celebrate with you a moment, and thanksgiving uh, to our newly appointed Bishop George D. Crenshaw for the magnificent 155th anniversary service on last Sunday morning. We're going to be talking about perfect love today. Perfect love. What in the world is that? Perfect love. Uh, I don't believe any of us are perfect, but I believe uh, we can be made perfect in love. As a matter of fact, Jesus declared uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, be you therefore perfect, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Now, he wasn't talking about you're going to be perfect in all of your uh, ways in that passage, and remember I said you always read the Bible in context. In that passage, the context of the passage is that Jesus was commanding us to love everybody, our enemies, the folk who don't like us and hate us, and to do good to them and to pray for those who despitefully use us, and he finally finishes by saying, be perfect, uh, even as the Father in heaven is perfect. And so we can be made perfect in love, uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be talking about perfect love from the first epistle of John, chapter 4. And I'm going to read uh, a little bit more than the printed passage uh, in our lesson plan uh, because I just think it's important for you to hear. First John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, is where I am going to begin today. But let's pray now. Father, thank you for the word of God and for uh, the opportunity to share it again. It's a privilege as well as an opportunity, so use these moments, I pray, to bless the children of God and the people everywhere. I pray for those who are in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, who are devastated. I ask, O oh God, uh, help us to do our best to be a blessing to your children. In the name of Jesus, I pray for their comfort, pray for strength, I pray for relief, for national and international relief uh, for Haiti. In the name of Jesus, I pray for salvation so that if they don't know you, uh, these relief efforts will bring them to the point of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And I give you thanks. I praise you now that you would give us your revelation and give us your insight. Give us humility of head and humility of heart so that we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Perfect love. Well, I know that you say, I've had a perfect love. Uh, I believe uh, all of my life, my mom's love, I thought was certainly perfect for us. Uh, and I'm sure my siblings would believe that, and some of us have fallen in love before, and we declare that that love was perfect uh, in as much as it was perfect for us, all right? Maybe not for everybody else, but perfect for us. And of course, some of us believe we have loved our children uh, in such a perfect way uh, that is not without errors in our ways, but in love, uh, being perfect in loving them. Now, uh, we're going to begin reading, and there are a lot of different dynamics. Let me give you a little background, because uh, the first epistle of John, written in a time where the church 
had to deal with heresy, that is, uh, doctrinal uh, beliefs or beliefs that came against the standard doctrine, Christian doctrine of the church, heresy. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting people will believe things so very quickly, even if it's not the truth. And it, it's so very easy uh, for that to happen. And, I, you know, a new wave of teaching comes along. It doesn't have to be based upon the Word of God. People will believe it uh, very often, uh, and it will have no real merit, no real significance, but people are still believing it. Well, uh, in the time of this writing, they're dealing with the heresy of, and people saying Jesus has not come in the flesh, uh, that he's not the Son of God, and of course they're dealing with uh, the group that we call the Gnostics, the Gnostics, um, and a Gnosticism focused on uh, denying uh, that Jesus had come in the flesh. They didn't have anything particularly good to believe about the flesh, but Jesus has indeed come in the flesh through the Virgin Mary. So see, that was at the crust of our basic doctrine as Christians. Uh, so uh, one of that those big heresies, as you would call it, would be the belief of the Gnostics infiltrating into the church. Uh, I remember the late Bishop Richard Keith Thompson, uh, I think, preaching a sermon at Lomax Hannon Junior College site in Greenville, Alabama, and it was an ordination sermon, a, a sermon whereby he was trying uh, to encourage uh, the the new ordinands or those who were being ordained, and he said, uh, defend the faith, defend the faith. I always see myself as a defender of the Christian faith. Not not supposed to buy into everything. I'm supposed to weigh everything according to the Word of God, and it doesn't matter who says it, whether they are world renowned or whether they are uh, in the Episcopal see or whether it's it, uh, if it was the Pope, and I'm not saying it is, if it was the Pope, everything gets weighed uh, according to Scripture. Uh, it could be a, a very uh, famous or a pastor or a mega church pastor, but everything gets weighed according to the Word of God. And is it biblically uh, accurate and theologically correct? And so we have to always look at it from that perspective. As a defender of this Christian faith, no, I don't just listen to what people say. I listen to what people say, and I scrutinize it with the Word of God to see if that's what Jesus has said, because ultimately, it is only what the Lord said in this Word that counts. Uh, I've been teaching younger preachers since uh, the last 33 years, and uh, the last 30, almost 34 years now, and one of the things that I've always said to them as they would come to class uh, with their homework assignments, one of the things I said to them, say to them early on, remember, when you're arguing uh, from a, a theological perspective, remember if your argument is not substantiated by the Word of God, grounded in the Word of God, I said, no, before you get to my class, your argument is going to be considered invalid and it will not have any merit. And so, as children of God, it's what the Scripture says to us that matters most. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, everything somebody else says doesn't matter at all. I am saying what matters most to us is what is in the Word of God. And we've got to get me be sure that we stay in the Word of God, that we not only read it, but that we study and we go to studies and we hear. And I, I want to encourage uh, everybody to, to read the Word of God, but also to get into studying the Word of God with people who have studied, all right? Because you can so very easily get tripped up and you can believe in what would be, could be a heresy, uh, something that's untrue that has infiltrated into uh, the church of the kingdom of God, and it's a false doctrine. And so uh, let's not just try to go at it on our own. I remember growing up, uh, and I'll get to the text after this. This is a long introduction. Uh, growing up, uh, some of the older people would say, 
The Bible is, the word of God is so plain, a fool can error. I thought that was significant back then, but I learned that that wasn't true. The Bible is a very complex book. Uh, the Bible is uh, not, has not been dropped out of the sky by God. It has been compiled over a few thousand years. And so, and there are so many different writers, uh, some known, some not known. And so it's a very complex uh, book. And so, yes, it's very easy for us to error, uh, you for me and, and for others. All right. Now, after saying all of that, uh, the epistle of John was written during a time where the church, uh, received adversity and where there were heresies, uh, going on in Christendom. All right. So that people were bringing false doctrine into the church. All right. Now, I'm going to begin reading at verse number one of the first epistle of John, chapter four. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now that's a big, big deal. Uh, I may have to do a verse by verse today. Uh, test the spirits by the spirits. Now, uh, of course, uh, implicit in this is that uh, we are born uh, of the Spirit of God. So if we're going to test the spirits to see whether they are of God, that we've got to be born of the Spirit ourselves, and we've got to have a good, uh, solid foundation in the Word of God. That's important. Uh, there are many false prophets out in the world. Test the spirits by the spirits to see if they be of God. Now, people who are working against other people, whether they are preachers or whether they are members of the church, you know that's not God. God does not send us out to work against each other, all right, against the body of Christ. At the same time, he doesn't send us out to deceive and then for others to believe we're to just accept the deception and go on and act as though Nothing, no deception is going on. That's not God either. And so you got to understand, you got to test the spirits by the spirits to see if the spirits be of God. Now look at the second thing, uh, the second verse. It says, uh, actually the first verse, let me get the first, last part of that. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now that's unfortunate, but remember Jesus already said this in the gospels, uh, that there would be many false prophets. And so everybody is not uh, offering the word of God. Everybody is not declaring the truth of scripture for Jesus. Everybody does not mean uh, to have Jesus message and Jesus kingdom to be advanced and furthered. You, you, uh, you got to test the spirit. You've got to test the spirits. Listen, we've had some horrific things to happen in history uh, right here in America and outside of America as well, because we've had, and I guess we forevermore are going to be talking about the Jim Jones uh, deal uh, in, in Africa, and we're going to forevermore, or wherever it was, we're going to be talking about the David Caress and the mess in Waco, Texas, and, and some things that happened in other places where people uh, were lethally injected or where they in, uh, ingested themselves with uh, poison. Uh, Test the spirits. One, may I just say, as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, don't fall off blindly behind anybody. Okay, people say, well, you always have good things to say. Uh, no, I don't always have good things to say, but I can't publicly declare all of the things that I see and address with uh, prophets and uh, false prophets and preachers, okay? But I do know that everything that's out here does not represent the truth of Scripture nor the Word of God. Uh, and you pray for me, as my late sister would say, I don't see everything. I don't see uh, perhaps a lot of things, but a lot of things I do see, and by God's grace, I'm trying to address those things, all right? So there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. What's a false prophet? A false prophet is a person who does not represent uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't represent the Almighty God, all right? He, could, he or she could be ever so eloquent, ever so intellectual, 
Uh, they could be people who amass great wealth, excuse me, and look like they are prospering according to a standard uh, that, that is in the world. However, their message is false. Uh, their way of living would be false. And what they are espousing in, uh, to you would be false. And what they're trying to receive from you would be based on a selfish uh, motive and selfish gain or selfish advantage. And so there are many false prophets out in the world. Now, let me hasten to say, uh, let's not get this twisted. Because those of us who work full time in the ministry of Jesus Christ deserve to be paid. And we deserve to be paid well, I might add. Uh, it's quite insulting for some people to try and uh, declare that the pastors of churches who work 56 hours a week and who have trained and who have done their due diligence don't deserve to make good salaries. Well, that's very offensive to me because I don't know too many things uh, that required intellect uh, that I did not have the ability to do when I came through uh, with Tumka High School. I was contemplated on doing whatever I wanted to do because my brain was that good by God's grace. However, uh, in my freshman year of college, I was called to preach, and that changed my whole life. And so I, I just detest when people act as though uh, maybe uh, somebody who has become a lawyer deserves to be paid more uh, on a regular basis. I'm not talking about some high-powered deal on a regular basis or somebody who is made judge or somebody who has uh, become an MD or whatever the case is or successful businessman and then you, you uh, relegate the preacher to as close to minimum wage as you can or just a little bit above that. No, that's ungodliness to the core. Uh, we are supposed to be valued, and the Bible says the laborer is worthy of his or her hire. And let the elder who rules well be worthy of double honor. And so uh, you can see that in Scripture, how people treated the prophet, the men of God, and uh, some of the women of God, all right? So I detest that. That's not a false prophet just because the person uh, wants to be paid well, wants to be paid professionally and be in a, a financial category of others who have like uh, time in degrees and, and training experience, all right? By the other side, you flip that over and maybe you will get, maybe some preachers are just greedy for gain. They can never get enough and they are always asking for more and they will even hook and crook and uh, slip and slide and deceive uh, and thieve to get whatever uh, they can put their hands on. Now, that is false, and, and uh, God is not a part of that either. And so you've got one on one hand, one on the other hand, and uh, we need to make sure we get it right, okay? So, a false prophet. There are many that are out in the world, so we know already there are false prophets in the world right now, and there are people who are on uh, television and radio and, and Facebook and Zoom and conference calls, and, and, and they are deceiving many people with false prophecy. Let me encourage you today, and I didn't mean to talk this long about false prophets, but this has bothered me a long time. You should always hear the sermon, hear the teaching that is being made, and then go back and examine it with the word of God and see if that's what the Lord is declaring and see if whether they have been accurate uh, in declaring the word of God. Somebody was reading something uh, not too long ago in a meeting that I was attending and uh, when they finished reading what they were reading and say, see, and, and here it says it right here. And I said to them, you didn't read all the passage. You've got to read all the passage in order to get the full understanding and the full meaning of it. Read the rest of the passage. And when the rest of it was read, it changed the whole dynamic of what we were talking about. And there again, that's just an example that we have got to you hear what the preacher says or the teacher and then use the Bible to see if that's consistent and accurate with the word of God. Many false prophets that have gone out into the world. Now look at verse two. By this you know the spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. I said at the outset uh, that the Gnostics did not believe that uh, Jesus had come in the flesh, so they were rejecting uh, this thing about the flesh, all right? And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it, that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Now, uh, the Gnostics uh, believe in what they call the Gnosis, so if you could get a spark or special knowledge. You could be enlightened and you could save. If I remember correctly, you could even save yourself if you just got uh, the enlightenment, the knowledge of how to save yourself, then you could save yourself. Well, that goes against the core of what we believe as the children of God. You can't save yourself. You're not saved by knowledge. You're not saved by uh, your intellect. You're not saved by your ability. You are saved by grace through faith. You're saved by the unmerited favor, the goodness of God through Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ who has died on a cross for your sins and the sins of the whole world. And as we confess him with our mouths and believe in him with our hearts that, listen, that God has raised him from the dead, we are saved. All right. Now, uh, the text says the Antichrist is already in the world. That So the Antichrist is going to declare Jesus hasn't come. The Antichrist is going to declare Jesus is a fake. The Antichrist is going to declare don't believe uh, in the gospel. Then, you know, the Antichrist is going to always be against Jesus. That's why he's considered the Antichrist. Anybody that's anti-Shuford is going to be against Claude Shuford, okay? If he's anti, uh, let me be more specific, anti-Claude Shuford would be somebody against Claude Shuford, okay? Anti-Shuford would be somebody that's against the Shuferts, all right? Now, so anti-Christ is somebody that's against Jesus, and whatever Jesus has established, and whatever Jesus has going, and whatever Jesus and the Holy Ghost and God the Father are doing in the world, the Antichrist is against that. Now understand, you can't be for Jesus and be against him. You remember uh, the disciples saw somebody, thinking of the Gospel of Luke, uh, casting out some demons, and they forbade him. And they came back and told Jesus, we saw some men... Uh, casting out demons in your name. And we told them to stop it. And Jesus said, leave them alone. Those who are with me are not against me. Those who are for me are not against me. The Antichrist will always be against. That's why he's anti. He'll always be against Jesus. Now, look at the next verse. Jesus says, Antichrist are already in the world. Verse 4. Little children, I like this, i got to come back to that. Little children, you are from God and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now, uh, little children, I, I, I love this passage because sometimes it's just uh, necessary that we are reminded that we are not grown uh, when we come before God. Now, I know sometimes we've tried to act grown, uh, you know, as Job did. Uh, read Job 23, and you'll see Job uh, trying to be grown before God. And then in, in Job 38, uh, God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind, and Job understood he was nowhere near grown to be trying to talk to God like he was equal to God. All right? And then, of course, in uh, Job repents. Uh, in Job uh, 42, God restored Job and gave him twice what he had after he had repented and gone and prayed uh, for his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Now, we're little children. Um, right now, I don't have any little children. I have a big teenage daughter who is 15 uh, and a half years old, and she, she, will, she won't accept that little children stuff. Now, she's little compared to my 25-year-old and my almost 35-year-old. She's little compared to them, okay? However, I have some grandchildren 
Now, they are what you call little children, okay? Six, five, one, and a few months old. Little children. They, those are little children, okay? And little children expect uh, everything from their parents. Little children, you don't expect them to uh, uh, have sense on their own. You don't expect them to make the best choices by themselves. You don't expect them to take care of themselves and to do particular things for themselves because they are little children. Now, I wish we could understand this and accept it as believers in Jesus Christ. He calls us little children in the text because we can't make good decisions on our own in the kingdom. And we need the Lord to speak to us, to lead us, to protect us, to help us do whatever it is we need to do. So he calls us little children. And he says we are from God. Which means we've, we've been born of the Spirit of God, so we are from God, and we have conquered uh, against the Antichrist already. Now, you love this part. He says, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm never believing a day that the world uh, has to ups on me or that somebody has to ups on me when I know they're not, they're not doing the will of God. Hello. Uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I love this passage. Greater is he, that is, the Holy Ghost lives in you. The Holy Spirit, if you will, lives in you. And he is the Lord God. He is Jesus inside of you. He is the Father inside of you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And so don't you allow uh, your thought pattern or your feelings to believe you're defeated, that you're down. Uh, no, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Don't you allow anybody to tell you you're no good. Uh, you're going to be good for nothing. Or you're not going to amount to anything. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And because greater is he that is in you, you can triumph. You can have a new start. You can go on. You can succeed. You can reach the next plateau. You can go farther because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can lay hands on the sick and they recover. You can believe God to move a mountain and the mountain is moved. You can come up out of the valley. You can acquire. You can accumulate. You can reach a measure of success. You can do better. You can be delivered. You can walk the line. You can walk to walk and talk to talk. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. you got to believe it. Listen, I grew up believing this because uh, of what I saw in my mom and then uh, in my uh, late uh, in my late dad and my sisters I saw. Uh, greater. I didn't see it as much I thought in my dad until the later years. I started understanding some different dynamics. But I saw something in my mom that always said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I kept seeing that now uh, with the lady who had a GED and married someone with a third grade education and uh, had 11 children for it, but who had such a uh, passion, such a passion for Jesus, and such a compassion for people, and such, listen to this, and such uh, a consistency and constancy for worship and prayer, and for a work ethic, and who commanded her children, uh, you know, to be in school, and who carried them to Sunday school, and to church, every, such, such a model, I believe, for us, and then I began to understand later, it was because greater was he that was in her than he that was in the world. There are many stories I could tell you about that lady going on, I believe, to be with the Lord that I don't have time. But I saw the greater in her than he that was in the world. 
That's a big thing. Great is he that's in you. If you have been saved, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, greater is Jesus, greater is the Holy Spirit, uh, or greater is the Holy Ghost that's in you than he that is in the world. You can, uh, you can, you can be delivered. Uh, you can be set free. You can get over that addiction. You can quit smoking. You can quit drinking. You can quit whatever it is you're doing. You can quit shooting up. And the examples are all around us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, I've got a great friend who used to be a crack addict, a cocaine addict, and uh, his mom and I would stand at the altar and pray for him, pray for his deliverance. And, I, and in time, it didn't happen just overnight, but in time, and I didn't know how bad it was. He wasn't my friend. And he wasn't even my church member. Uh, his mom was my church member. And we kept praying for his deliverance. And God heard our prayers. Not just mine, not just his mom, but he heard the body of Christ's prayers. Praying for this man. Heard all of our prayers. And delivered him. And he say, he testified, what a great change. And now greater is he that is in him than he that was in the world. It can happen. It can happen. And it's a beautiful thing. Let me, let me go on. Uh, verse number seven. Beloved, I'm sorry, I didn't read all of what I was reading. Let's go to verse number five. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world. And the world listens to them. Now let me, let me pause here to say, be careful who you are listening to and agreeing with. And again, everything under the scrutiny of the Word of God, and everything will it uh, is it substantiated by the Word of God? Is it really what the Lord is saying? Somebody said to me once, "Said you're going to send all of our money overseas? Are you trying to every time I turn around, you're talking about doing something for the folk overseas?" And uh, they had a little attitude uh, with me. But what they needed was a different aptitude for the Word of God. Because the Word of God teaches us both to do home missions and overseas missions. To make disciples around us and to make disciples around the world. And so, no, I didn't spend more overseas than I spent around us. And somebody else said, well, you give more money to the folks that are strangers than you do to the members of the church. And they were just espousing their ignorance because that is never the case. But I would never just care about the people I pastor. That would be against the word of God. That would not be substantiated by the word of God. You've got to care about the people I pastor or the people in the church with you. And you're supposed to care about the people who are in the community. And you're supposed to care about the people who are not in your community and who are not in your state, who are not in your city, your state, who are not in your country. Jesus told the disciples to make disciples of the nations. That's a big deal. That's that's a big deal. Uh, uh, get ready. We're going to Africa, uh, hopefully, uh, in another year and a half, all right? Hopefully, by then, COVID-19 would have been conquered, all right? Uh, but we're to make what? Disciples of the nation. So you, you've got to be careful. The world says a lot of different things. You can't believe what the world says. You know, and sometimes, unfortunately, People who have gotten saved will say what the world says, and then that's confusing too because they're not supposed to say what the world says. Let me go on to the next verse. I don't want to get bogged down on that. Uh, verse 5 says, uh, the world listens to the world. Verse 6 says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Oh, so once you get saved, you're supposed to be listening to the preacher, the Christian preacher, the Christian Sunday school teacher, the Christian Bible study teacher. You're supposed to be listening to those who are declaring the word of God. 
And people say, well, I really don't have time uh, for Sunday school. I really don't have time uh, for Bible study. Man, I got so much going on now. You don't have so much going on. You just don't have the right priorities. You don't have the right priorities and the right perspective because whenever a believer puts Jesus on the back burner and puts the word of God and studying and spiritual disciplines on the back burner, we have missed the mark because uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 says that the believers continue constantly, steadfastly. They devoted themselves in their apostles' teaching, uh, into fellowship, uh, the breaking of bread and prayers so that they, they develop a religious diet if you will, a religious practice, a routine of hearing the word of God, submitting themselves to the teaching of the word. Whoever knows God listens to the uh, uh, preachers and the teachers of the word of God. Wow. And whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So people who say, well, I don't have to listen to you all, uh, that's the Antichrist spirit. If you're a believer, you have to listen to believers who are teaching and preaching the unadulterated, pure word of God. Yeah, oh, yes, you have to do that. Say, well, I got saved, I'm going home read my Bible for myself. Uh, and you're already confused because the Bible never tells you to get saved and go home and read the, your Bible for yourself and ignore the rest of the body of Christ. See, that in itself is the opposite of what the Bible says. The man said to me once, he said, well, I don't uh, I, I go to Sunday school, but I don't go to worship. And he thought that that was a big thing. And I said, well, you're not, you're not doing the right thing, my brother. You are not doing the right thing because uh, the Bible says don't forsake to assemble yourselves together with the believers. And the believers worship and study and pray together. And he went on to tell me how bad some believers are and all of that kind of thing. And I said, yeah, they, there, there are imperfections in the body of Christ. That's without debate. But the body of Christ is still the best thing going in life. The Christian church is still uh, at the apex of everything that you name in life. Take the Christian church out, and where would we be? With all of our imperfections, with all of the mess-ups, the sins, the mistakes, the embarrassments, take the Christian church out. Tell me where America would be. If you think we're down now, you don't know what down is. We would be under the ground without the Christian church espousing and proclaiming the word of God and living and practicing and serving in the name of Jesus. Take it away. And this country would go on the ground very quickly. Now, let me, let me hasten. Verse 7 says, uh, Beloved, let us love one another. This is first, the first epistle of John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. I wanted to get to this. Uh, we've got a Christian education song. Uh, we are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity will one day be restored. And they all know we are Christians by our love. That's an A.M.E. Zion song uh, written by an A.M.E. Zion. And they all know we're Christians by our love. Not because we jump up and down or run around. Not because uh, we have something to... Uh, most eloquent preachers are some of the uh, uh, best sounding preachers, not because uh, we have some edifices uh, that, that are renowned, not because uh, we just have bishops in the church. No, not because uh, we can speak in tongues. He says, no, they are no, uh, we are Christians by our love. And the verse says, uh, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, listen to this, does not know God, for God is love. God is love. God is not hatred. God is not revenge. 
God is not nastiness. God is not meanness. God is not arrogant or arrogance or haughtiness. And you know, God, God is not, I give him the hand, I wave him off. That's not God. I give him uh, the evil look. That's not God. God is love. Wow. And you talk about a perfect love. Well, we're talking about perfect love when we're talking about God is love. In him there is no darkness. In him there is no evil at all. His love is perfect. Perfect love. You know, I can't say that my love is always perfect. No, I can't say that. I'm still working on it. Hallelujah. But, but I'm not consistently trying. I'm not consistently ignoring trying to love people. You know, some people are just nasty, unkind. They, they're that way almost every time you see them. Oh, yeah, but God is love, and God has commanded us to love. Look, look at the next verse. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Um, I said this to you a little while ago. Maybe some of you all were listening. Maybe some of you weren't. But let me say it once again. Uh, when a family member was down and out, uh, felt like they were at the end of the ropes, uh, said to me that God did not love them. And I said to them, how do you know he doesn't love them? Doesn't love you. And they said, because of everything that he has done this year. Uh, to hurt me. And I said, the symbol of God's love is not what God allows to come into your life now. The symbol of God's love, the demonstrative action of God's love is that Jesus went to Calvary to die for your sinful self. <laughs> so you want to talk about whether or not God loves you? Go to Calvary. Go and look at a cross. And don't go and get one of those pretty diamond crosses or, or gold crosses or, or sterling silver or whatever they are. Uh, no, don't go get one of these crosses that's fancy. Go outside and get you a couple of pieces of rough sticks and put them together and make your cross out of it. And then let your mind try to go back 2,021 years and, and see Jesus dying on a cross. Mm -hmm. Go back 2,000 years and get Jesus carrying an old, heavy Roman cross and get Jesus. Look at him in your mind being whipped and his flesh being torn off of his body. And, and he took it. And then the next day he went out bearing his own cross and he went forth to the, the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, or the place called Calvary, where they crucified criminals, and he had done no evil, and there was no deceit or guile in his mouth. He was sinless, but he went to Calvary to die for sinners. Sinners who needed to be saved, like you, like Claude Shuford, like the rest of the creation uh, creatures in the world. That's the example of love, of God's love, demonstrated in such a dynamic and magnificent way that there is nothing you can name that will compare to that. Nothing. I know God got him out of, brought him out of darkness into the marvelous light. He made a way. He's the way maker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness, the miracle worker, all of, Yeah, he's all of that. But the ultimate of what God has done for you and the ultimate of what God has done for me and the ultimate of what God has done for every person created in the image of God, God sent his son, Jesus. He died for our sins. Hallelujah. All right, let me get back. I'm about to start preaching. Let's see. Uh, it's okay if I preach a little bit anyway. All right, it's okay. Uh, verse 10 says, 
uh, verse 9 says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10 says, in this is love. Not that we love God. Hmm? In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now listen to this. Since God has loved us so much, we ought to be able to love one another. The pastor says, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. We ought to love one. And you know what it is to love somebody. You don't love somebody being nasty to them or mean. Or you don't, you have, you're apathetic toward them. You just don't care about them. Or you're so snooty, acted toward them. You don't want to be bothered with them, you know, and everything else that goes with that. That's not how God treated you when we were sinners. Romans 5, we had that a little while ago. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, let me hurry up and get, get to uh, the latter part. So I don't want to uh, miss the final verses. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Listen, Romans 5 again. He has poured his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So listen, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, don't just walk around speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is good. Don't just walk around uh, and exalt or uh, 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 be uh, uh, carried away with miracles and, and things that are outward. Listen, if, if the Spirit of God lives in you, the real dynamic is how you love. How you love. That's the real dynamic. That's the one I try to work on the most. How, how do I love? And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. So if you abide in God, you abide in love, and love abides in you, and you know you can love. But you can see some people not loving the way they treat other people. Love is not this, this uh, scheming and deceiving and all this other stuff. Verse 17, and I'll end here uh, with chapter 4. Uh, love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, there are uh, two more verses. I've got to skip over to chapter 5 and get these other two crown verses, okay? First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Let me read them uh, to you. For whatever is born of God it, uh, conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You know, faith not only gets us saved by God's grace, but faith helps us to conquer the world, the patterns of the world, the things of the world. It's your faith. Faith brings us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it causes us to study and believe the word of God. And that's how we conquer the world. There are always going to be patterns and systems in the world. Always. There are going to be some good ones and there are going to be some uh, corrupt ones and some wicked patterns and systems in the world. There are always going to be those who are going to look out for themselves and not for the body of Christ. Listen, that's, that's ongoing. But, our faith puts us in a different place. Now look at, look at your faith. And look at where you were before you were saved. Huh? Look at where you were before you were saved. 
and then think about how your faith has given you victory through Jesus Christ. Our faith keeps us going. The, my faith keeps me coming to this microphone. Somebody say, well, no, the check keeps you coming to the microphone. No. Because I was preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel before I got a good check. Hello. And if I have to go back to that, I'll go back to that. My faith will keep me coming. My faith will continue to make me proclaim. My faith will push me forward to love, to care. Because the word of God commands it so. And so, if we're going to have perfect love, we've got to allow the Spirit of God to live in us. And that means Jesus will live in us when the Spirit of God lives in us. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, you will love. Because Jesus will be abiding in you, the Father will be abiding in you, and God is love. It's baffling to me how some people talk about uh, they love God and they love the kingdom and they love the church and, and uh, yeah, I love you, and they do nothing. What kind of love is that? That's no kind of love. Love gives. You, you cannot love without giving. You cannot love without giving. You can give without loving. You might have given it out of spite. You might have given it because you felt uh, uh, coerced or persuaded. Uh, you felt threatened or whatever the case might be. But, but you cannot love without giving. Examine your own self. I've, I've got to uh, give my offering to Haiti because I love people. You can't love people without giving. Now, there are limitations. <laughs> there are limitations. I can't give to everybody I see with a cup or with a piece of cardboard or a sign at all of these exits. They're there every week. I can't give to all. I, I don't have it. I can't give to all. Maybe I could give all a dollar. So I try and give as I'm let to give or moved by the Spirit of God to give in those cases. And that's, that's every month, basically. But you cannot love without giving. You give time, you give emotions, you give money, you give service, you give advice, you give care, you give concern, etc. It's impossible to love without giving. Our lesson was entitled, Perfect Love. That's the love Jesus has given us, that God the Father has given us, that the Holy Ghost gives us inside of us. Because when the Spirit of God lives in you, you have love in you, abiding, operating, prompting you moving you forward to do good in his name. Father, I want to thank you for the lesson today. I know that the early church had to deal with all kinds of false doctrines, and and sometimes uh, they erred, and sometimes we've erred, and we have to deal with false doctrine. But I thank you for your love. You've never thrown us away. You've never ignored us. You've never, ever ceased to bless your church, your believers, your universal body of Christ, with all of our various styles and cultures and, and with our isms and, and our traditions and customs, uh, you have never ceased to bless us. Uh, we're just glad that we're your children and that we are, we're glad we don't have to be the same. We can have different styles. We can have different cultures. Uh, as long as they are substantiated uh, with the Word of God or by the Word of God. We're glad we don't have to be the same racial color or skin color. Uh, we're glad we don't have to have the same ethnicity and that we don't have to be from the same social or uh, socioeconomical or educational group 
we're glad that you've got people all around the globe, uh, some at the, uh, in the higher echelon of society, some on the lower levels uh, in society, some in between. And we're glad that some are a part of the intelligentsia and the business world and the judicial system and the governmental system, oh God. Uh, even the executive branch of government. And then we're glad that there are what we call uh, common laborers. Uh, for the common laborers really cause us to be who we are because while we might have come up with a great idea of what would we be uh, without laborers. So I pray, oh God, for all of us uh, that we would uh, treat those who are around us as we want to be treated. Help us to love like you love. Uh, and to, to lavish people in love, even as we prayed and read last week, to move one another to love and to serve. And so I pray for us because we're always challenged to be better. Help us to be better for the kingdom in the name of Jesus. Help me to be better for your kingdom. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friends, I guess that's about it for today. I'll be back tonight uh, with the Luke Lucan study. And we are at the end, almost at the end of a quarter in a week or so, and we're going to start a new quarter. And I've had such a great time uh, with uh, these particular lessons. I hope that you're being blessed by them. It's our intent to do something very simple to get the word of God out so that you would hear it and believe it and be impacted by it and so that you'll become what we call a practitioner of the faith. You will live out this faith and you'll be more effective in your divine assignments. You'll be more equipped to do what God has assigned to you. And so I want to always thank you for joining Mount Zion and for listening. You can give, of course, uh, through our cash app of Mount Zion, AME Zion. We're right here in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, or you can download on your smartphone or computer the GiveLify app, and it's Mount Zion, AME Zion uh, Church right here in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, you shouldn't have any trouble with that. If you do, uh, you can dial our church office or you can go to our website uh, and get more information. So until 6 o'clock this evening, uh, let me again thank you for joining us. Let me encourage you. Keep praying for the people in Haiti. Keep praying for us. Uh, and that this violence uh, right here in America and in Montgomery, Alabama will, will cease. Uh, let's, let's be more diligent, more vigilant, make more sacrifices for our good, for the good of our communities and our people. Until the next time, Claude Schufert and the members of the Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. That's a long name, but remember there are two Zions in it. It's Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And since I've got a minute left, we are African because of our descent but we were founded in New York City, New York, in 1796. Uh, now we are on five continents and about 25 countries uh, or more around the globe. I've got to count them again now. And not only that, uh, we are Methodists because of what we believe and, and our discipline. We are Episcopal because we are governed by bishops and we are Zion. Because we're the children of God, the people of God. Mount Zion, AME Zion Church, Montgomery, Alabama. Until the next time, Claude Schufert and Mount Zion, God bless you. Have a great day.